Hello, everyone. Welcome to Saturday Night Live on the Dominic Wong Weekend Show, where we have grassroots conversations about Malaysian and sometimes international current affairs. Today, we have YB Tony Pua, who is MP for Damansara. He was instrumental in exposing the One Malaysia Development Burhat 50 billion ringgit debt scandal in Malaysia Parliament since 2014, which brought down the Najib Razak administration. In 2018, he became special officer and later political secretary to the Minister of Finance under the first historic Harapan government until the Sheraton coup in February 2020. He also wrote and he is the author of The Tiger Who Lost Its Raw in 2011. So that's a small little book that's from YB Tony. And uh, he is also now a painter at Theatre Impian, the Lim Kit Siang Art Gallery. Without further ado, we are so excited to meet you. Would you like to introduce your journey in politics and your personal background, YB? Hi, hi. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you for having me on the show. Um, I don't know what to say about my journey. I, 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 I joined politics in 2007. Uh, first elected in 2008 after my first contest. Uh, the constituency was then known as Taling Jaya Utara. This is my third term and the constituency has been renamed as Damansara and at the same time enlarged as well. Previously, I had about 90 plus minus thousand voters. Today, I have close to about 160,000 voters. So that goes all the way from uh, the south of my constituency, if you know Plank Valley, uh, that is Sungai Way, uh, near the Motorola Junction there. Uh, Motorola is not in my constituency, but near there. Uh, it goes all the way, LDP up north, then left, head to Sungai Bolo Hospital. Okay. Where the Kobe hospital is, uh, that's actually within, on the, on the northwestern limit of my constituency, Sungai Hospital, wow. Sungai Bolo. Uh, and if you make a U-turn and take the MRR, uh, Middle Ring Road, right across uh, to the eastern side, uh, so along the KL Selangor border, uh, okay. that's all my territory. So I'm a big uh, yes. fire leader. That's all my territory, all the way up to the road opposite Hospital Slayer. Wow, that's a very big area. I think yours yeah, is the so most populated uh, parliament second constituency. Most populated. Second, second most, most populated. populated. Yeah, yes. the biggest one is Bangi. Yeah, but okay. it's, it's very dense. And and the, the the problem is while the voters are around 160,000, the residents are many times more. Reason being many of, of the people are voters outstationed, but they stay in my constituency. Ah. So when voting comes, they actually go back to vote. So you also have to somewhat take care of uh, these people. Yeah. So yes. so so it is it is a big kawasan thanks to the previous uh, Parisan National Government. Yes, yes. Yeah. I remember also when I was young. I think Petaling Jaya Utara, Petaling Jaya Selatan were oh, MCA yeah, yeah, strong you were young. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. Nowadays, COVID, right? Uncle, oh, yeah, people older. already you know. Everyone on this show is very young tonight. <laughs> but definitely, um, Damansara is the cultural capital of Malaysia. It is also an economic hub of Malaysia. Um, a lot of people um, have higher education standards, somewhat um, higher levels of literacy and education. YB Tony Pa as well. Uh, personally, I think you are also trained a economist as well, turned businessman, turned MP for Parliament in 2008. Um, I think in your book, as well, you mentioned very briefly, you said that why um, was it the Secretary General, Lim Guan Eng, who encouraged you to join politics in 2008, 2007? Well, I would to 2006. Uh, I first met Kitsiang in 2005. But it, that, that was more that was more fish looking for bait rather than bait found fish. So ah. it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a bit, uh, yeah fish looking for bait yeah so 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 the opportunity came uh yeah. and the conditions for my business was such that i could uh, let go without too much concern about the well-being of the staff uh things were improving and doing quite well uh then i can let go and and do my other stuff yeah okay so since 2008 it has been 13 years how have your 
political philosophy change that so much has happened uh, the government you know selangor election 2008 coming to power in selangor 2013 you know bringing up that up some more in 2018 the harapan government and then right now uh, in 2021 you know it's been two years of covid and then there was a change of government under um, the sheraton move um what how despite all these setbacks and also in 2016 i think you ran um for the selangor state committee as well um how have all these experiences um changed your motivations or changed the way you look at politics have you looked back ever since um okay let, let me start first by giving the um, broad picture the broad picture is i joined uh, politics in 207 uh to do my part uh i've been very blessed uh in since i was young i was from a kampung so so i had a lot of uh, help along the way to get to where i am uh getting a scholarship to go to singapore getting a scholarship to go to uk in one of the top universities in the world uh coming back and starting work and being able to do a startup and getting it listed in singapore uh I'm blessed, and and it was meant to be a time, and it was always uh, planned that way, where I could take a step back from everything me to every more about me giving what I can give. So that was two o o seven. I joined politics as a means of giving back. Uh, to help, uh, also as to play my part to kick some ass uh, in Parliament. Uh, perhaps get elected, go into Parliament, make some noise, uh, do this for a couple of years, and then the, pass the baton over to some younger kids uh, who hopefully I can suckle quite a few to join politics, and then they take over from that. Um, the, the 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 view I had was um, I I followed Kit Yang's story um, since I was a teenager. Uh, I knew the difficulties and the sacrifice, uh, and the fact that he has done a lot uh, to 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 further the cause of uh, rights and democracy in Malaysia. But the bridge was incomplete, so it, it was like one third built. So what I wanted to do was build another five inches or ten inches, and I hand it over to the next generation to complete the bridge. So never in my wildest dream did I expect that in two o eight we could win Selangor. Mm. And of course, never in anybody's wildest dream, if you ask me back in two o seven, ten years later, we will defeat Barisan National and become part of government. Ta-da. Yes. Never. So even in politics, I have achieved personally, from a personal satisfaction perspective, more than what I could ever dream for. You know, yes, things are kind of a bit of a mess now. You have uh, Lanka Sheraton followed by a government that is a minority, half baked, full of incompetent people. People are depressed, perhaps also because when Pakatan was. In government, we we couldn't fully uh, make use of the opportunity to deliver some of the promises. Not that we don't want to, but there are constraints and there are steps that need to be taken, and there are some things that need time to deliver. You know, despite all that, you know, today I see ourselves as being in a better position than we were when the country was basically under the thumb of Amno. And Barisan National. Yes. So we are in a period of transition, and transition is unfortunately sometimes painful. But if yes. if maybe by the time I'm eighty or by the time you are sixty, you will look back in this short period of time and see it as a very short transition period. You know, when you look back, two three years is always very short. But when you are okay. in the two three years, it's always very painful. You know. So when when Malaysians look back in the future to these few years. This could be the pivotal years that mark the transition of Malaysia into a much better country. So that's that's the overall 
contact from it. Are you certain uh, that the future is progressive? Are you certain that uh, it will get better and not worse? Because uh, the normal uh, political I, commentary, I, it is negative. <laughs> I, I am as certain about it getting better as anyone can be certain that the stock market over the longer term will always go up. So historically, if you look at what we were, and I, 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 as you mentioned just now, I did the, I was involved in the theater MPM project, okay, yes, which is basically much. Uh, I can share the photo later, but uh, but we 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 it is it is actually uh, less about the painting, more about Kit Siang's journey. Yes. Okay, yes. So, but going through Kit Siang's journey, you see what he went through in the sixties, seventies, eighties, and followed by nineties. Uh, if you think today is hopeless, you would have thought that 207 is even more hopeless. And you would have thought that in 1999, when Kit Siang and Kapal Singh also lost their parliamentary seats, it was hopeless, hopeless. And you would have thought that in the 1970s, they don't stand a whiff of a chance. No, they are mad people who actually try to do crazy things because they are trying to do the impossible. But if you look at it, things are way, way, way better than they were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and 30 years ago. So what, what I'm trying to portray here and why I use the stock market as a reference point is if you look at the global stock market chart, doesn't matter what, like KLSE, Dow Jones, NASDAQ, doesn't matter what. Over the long term, the trend is always like this. But if you zoom in into specific periods, they'll always be up. And then there'll be downs. There'll be depressions, recessions, there will be corrections, right? and then it will take the trend up again. So we are moving in the right direction. And the only reason why we may stall, yes. or the only reason why we may walk backwards uh, yes. overall, yes. okay? Uh, we will always take three steps forward, two steps back. That's normal. Uh, but overall, the only reason why we might retard is if all Malaysians give up hope and all the young people decide to leave the country. Uh, if yes. that happens, yes. Uh, then I will actually tell you Malaysia is a hopeless case. But that's clearly not the case today. There are plenty of young people who are interested, who have a lot of heart uh, in building a better Malaysia. And as long as that commitment, that spirit continues and more people get involved, then I am absolutely certain that Malaysia will be a better place five years, 10 years, 20 years from today. Yes. Thank you for sharing that, YB, Tony. Uh, I hope everyone heard that. I think Malaysia needs all the young people to stay in Malaysia. So please listen out, hear out YB, Tony, and stay in Malaysia. Stay tuned for the next elections. Stay tuned for everyday politics. Until then, don't be tired. There's always hope in darkness. Um, one question, YB. Um, I think in 2018, um, you said... I think you said this, um, you did not want to become a minister because it involved many formalities and grant work. If given the opportunity, would you like to be um, a minister for the Democratic Action Party in the next government? Okay, I, I think, let me put it into context. Uh, will I ever uh, reject all ministerial positions? Uh, I can't say yes to that. Okay. Uh, there might be situations where it makes sense to be. But in 2018, uh, where the ministerial positions were scarce, number one. Number two, when our party secretary general got the big position in MOF, Ministry of Finance. Yes. It was critical that his, his uh, 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 role in MOF is fully supported and it was critical that he succeeded now it, it was not easy becoming the first non-malay to help the ministry of finance since the early 70s okay, since the early 70s no more non-malays okay so it was critical that he was successful so my my personal strength is yes. in economics and finance so I, I could have been a minister, whether appointed or not as a separate issue. I could have been a minister or deputy minister in some other ministries. Okay. And I think I would have done reasonably well without 
bragging lah. Okay? okay, I would have done okay. reasonably well. Okay, but where would I be able to contribute the most? Based on my personal interests, based on my strengths, and based on the needs of the party as well as the people. Yes, it will be with the more. There is no yes. no dispute, no question about it. So ministerial positions are secondary to what I can achieve. Now, whether I'm the name behind it, I'm not the name behind it. To it to me is irrelevant. I just want to do my part. Make sure we can show how MOF can behave and act differently, okay? and succeed in doing that. Showing that we can do better than all the previous finance ministers, and showing that despite being a say in this case Chinese finance minister, we actually uh, uh, help uh, improve the livelihood of the Malays, for example more than the previous Malay finance ministers. It was a critical way towards trying to break the ice between races in the country. You know, yes. Imagine if we are able to complete five terms, uh, five years in the term and demonstrated that we were able to lift the income of the poorest and in particular the Malays, it will break, it will increase the trust between the races and it can play a big role towards changing the face of the politics in Malaysia. So that, that was very, very important and very personal for me. Uh, and hence, I took whatever position that uh, was available to assist uh, running at MOF. Thank you so much for putting the party and the country first. I think the writer can see, they can read, you know, they know some of the contributions that YB Tony has uh, been um, contributing to the country in terms of exposing corruption, in terms of adding... Um, as well financial expertise, economy expertise to the Democratic Action Party in the various operacies behind. Um, I think all of this uh, didn't go unnoticed. So um, I think that's a very good introduction. Thank you for sharing so much about uh, how you join politics. Now I think we're going to move into the heart of today's topic. So today's topic is uh, stimulus check, navigating rising debt, slowing growth, and stagnant wages in Malaysia. So I think there are four a parts very here. Heavy topic. Yes, yes. It's about the stimulus packages the government has run, number one. The uh, fiscal debt that has been rising steadily over the past two decades. And then the third element of today's uh, topic is slowing economic growth. Uh, so we are going towards a slower economic plane as we mature as a country. And also it's something that is very perennial to all young people's heart, wages that are low or stagnating and not rising as fast as we expect of a developing, fastly developing country. Um, yep, yep. So anyone who's watching today, likes today's topic, would like to support the topic or our speaker today, please help us like, share, and maybe drop some constructive comments. Wabi Tony Pa, we'd be happy to take a few later um, in an hour's time, for example. So please stay tuned. So uh, the first question today is um, taking from a young person perspective. What is your financial advice for young people who are graduating now these two years during COVID-19 pandemic who are terrified of stagnant wages or falling wages? In fact, the Department of Statistics said the median and um, mean wages fell 16 and 9%. Um, and then there's light rising living costs. And then there's also high asset prices where property prices are three times higher now than my parents' time. Uh, and also the fact that the economy is turned over, the companies come and go very fast. There's a huge turnover in job. So maybe there was job insecurity. This is aided as well by maybe structural changes in the economy, digitalization and disruption. Yes, and do you have any comments? <laughs> Um, that, that's a big mouthful you mentioned just now for me to comment. So I will, I will put it perhaps in another perspective. Okay? We are facing challenges, no question yes. about it. And it is one of the biggest challenges that the country has faced. At different points of time, uh, different generations will have faced their challenge, uh, challenges and you are facing the current challenge. Um, yes. The, there's something you mentioned just now that people are terrified about the markets out there. Um, what I would say is being terrified doesn't help your cause. So don't waste your time being terrified. Easier said than done. Okay? Easier yeah. said than done. But don't waste your time being terrified because it does not, being terrified will not get you a job. Yes. Being terrified will not find food on your table. Okay, so being terrified is a useless uh, preoccupation. Yes. Okay? Now, what 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 perhaps the younger generation needs to do? The first mindset that needs to be done, and that was the mindset I had when I came out 
after working about one and a half years to two years to start my own business. Okay. I, I didn't come from a rich family. I didn't have huge startup capital. Uh, I broke from friends. I got I, I suckered a few friends to invest in my business, and that's not a lot. It's like ten thousand ringgit, twenty thousand ringgit, actually less than that uh, per person. Okay, to to invest in something and start something. A lot of people ask, "What if you fail?" That is that the first 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 fear. What if you fail? Yes. Wow, so brave! Start your own business. Yes. But my my thinking has always been, you no, know, um, I see a lot. For example. Okay, people without education, uh, doing financially, if not extremely well, fairly well. You no, know? whether running a grocery store or to some very manual things like cha kui diao, no, frying cha kui diao, hawker center, or or something else. Okay, they 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 didn't have formal education. They didn't have opportunities that. We have today, uh, and they did well. They could succeed. Yes. Now this idiot here, who graduated supposedly from one of the top schools in the world, you are telling me that this idiot here is afraid of failing to do what those people without those educational opportunities could have done. Cannot yes. be so tired. Right? Surely my education counted for something, you know. Yes. <laughs> ah, so. What's the worst case? Worst case is it really fail, yeah. but will I survive? Surely I can survive. Surely I'll find some other way of making it work. Worst come to worst, try my hand at Tha Koi Tiao. I will still be able to do a reasonable living. No, yeah. That's the worst, 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 worst case scenario. But knowing that the worst, 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 worst case scenario, I also can survive. What's that yeah. to be scared of? So yeah. the, the, the mindset among young people today should be the same. There's nothing to fear. We are living in a changing world. Identify what is changing. What are the opportunities arising? And take those opportunities because those old uncles and aunties cannot catch up with you. And, and that's what I did. When I came yes. out of business, what is my, my strategic advantage? What is my competitive advantage? My competitive advantage is not that I have money. Those Uncle, auntie with money or their children with money, they do what? They do property development. They buy land, they develop property. I have no yes. such money to develop property. I cannot do those business. But in 1997, what was nascent? The internet was nascent. This uncle, auntie all don't understand internet. I could understand internet. That was my age. And hence, I went into internet business consulting. You know? And that was where I developed. And it, today, it's a different world altogether. You know, mm. today is about your startups, your, your your gig economy and all sorts of other stuff that sometimes I don't understand myself, but you do. And that's where opportunity arises for the young people to grasp and build a future for themselves. Yep. Thank you for sharing that. Actually, it's so funny because uh, the Chakwetel joke you mentioned, all my friends use it. I use it as well. You know, if I can't make it in life, I'm going to sell Chakwetel. It's the standard. <laughs> I, I might actually end up there also. But then I think you also mentioned uh, people at university educations and graduates, they feel... They feel like they have gone through a rigorous academic process and then they expect that when they come out in society, they can have a small leg up, but we find that leg up not um, as big as we expected and then we will find having to start from the bottom over again. Do you think that uh, education, privilege, that gap, and then um, the relevant skills gap that comes with an acad academic education, all of these issues, do you think a university education, which is becoming more expensive and slightly seemingly less relevant is still important to young people today oh i think it's uh in in, in my view there are exceptions okay so it's not a hundred percent but in my view in general extremely important uh i i find i find i i, I always get upset when i hear of people saying that oh, yeah you see any you see also can get your degree past 10 already after that it doesn't matter what your degree because you'll be doing something mm -hmm. else anyway that's, that's not the right approach towards education and university. Or some parents say, hey, this degree better because you graduate faster. You know, that, that sort of thing. That's not the right thinking towards education. What education is supposed to do is not so much the paper. What it's supposed to do is supposed to exercise your brains. So it's a brain exercise. So if it takes three years to exercise your brains, it takes three years to exercise your brains. 
you know, two years is just not going to cut it. You know, something like that. So the, the whole purpose of university education to me is not, I, 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 I did economics, but I did a three subject topic, PPE, philosophy, yes. politics, yes. economics. Okay? So people ask me, why do you study philosophy? You know, to a lot, especially Chinese, huh? it's yeah. a completely waste of time subject. Yes. You know what, what questions we ask and study and write essays about in, in philosophy? Um, does this table in front of you exist? Wow. Is that a university level? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, 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 that's one of the, my first year subjects. Does it exist? Proof to me that it exists. I see it. Yeah. But when you dream, you also see things that does it exist? You know? So, 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 so these are critical thinking skills. They are completely useless from a practical knowledge standpoint, yeah. but they are very useful in training your brains to think. And that's what's useful, that's useful for, for, for young people when they graduate, they can think on their feet, okay, to any problems they are posed to them. Imagine if you are posed a problem, does this table exist? You can take on any question that's posed on you or problems that's posed on you when you graduate and deal with any other industry out there. You know? yes. So that's that's yes. to me the relevance. The thinking, the critical thinking, the the resourcefulness to find answers, uh, problem solving skills. These are yes. skills that you gain regardless of whatever subject that you study, whether it's history or or, or classics or engineering or biochemistry, it doesn't matter. It is the problem solving skills, it is the thinking skills that are important. Yep. And I tend to agree with you as well, because I think um, education is a lifelong subject and then it gives you, I think, to learn how to read, to learn how to think, to learn how to articulate ideas, to communicate, I think all of these, and doing it well as well, learning to write properly, all these things um, are basic foundational blocks. I, I feel should come at secondary level, but apparently these are the skills that I learned in university as well. No, it, um, it increases in intensity and depth. Intensity no, of course, you learn in secondary school, but it increases yeah. in intensity and depth as you get to tertiary education. Most people yes. think I already can read. That's it, enough. No, it's not enough. You must be able to read layers underneath the text that is presented uh, to you. Or read yes. yeah. uh, a piece of text is not about what is written there, but it's about what is not written there. You know? Yes. Uh, mm. uh, that, 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 those, those are the important elements that you're supposed to pick up via critical thinking skills in yeah. the unit. One main concern about the critical thinking skills and the university degree is the fact that in Malaysia, you can get a public school education, a university degree for 30,000 ringgit in engineering. But if you go uh, maybe 100,000 ringgit for three years, um, maybe like, yeah, between 30 and 100,000. But if you go abroad, you know, you can be 500, you can be 2 million for medicine or 1 million. So the cost is not everyone can afford, the cost differential. Absolutely. Yes. So at what price, you know, for this as well? Um, can people still gain that kind of uh, university experience in Malaysia and still excel in life in the future? Um, I, 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 I absolutely yep. think so. It's your yep. approach to education. If your approach to education is the fastest way to graduate, doesn't matter whether you go to top university or you go to local university, it's going to be the same outcome. But okay. your approach to education is about learning new things, picking up new skills, Okay, not just the knowledge, but the the, 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 the the thinking and the process behind it and fully getting involved uh, in, in, in the university uh, uh, life, then yes. I'm sure you will learn plenty uh, from your three years in, in, in college. All right. And then two other questions about financial advice. Huh? The first one was university. The second one is whether young Malaysians should climb the property ladder at current prices. And the third one is for capital formation for young people. You mentioned that you were a, you created a startup after one and a half years of working. So how do young people save up for their first million ringgit? How do they do that? Do they do mutual funds? Do they go to a full-time job and then they invest what they save? Um, or do they go straight into business and then they work from there? Do you have any general advice for property and also saving money for the future? Okay, let me put a caveat first. Huh? I'm not a certified financial advisor. Yes. <laughs> personal opinion. Okay. Only. But, but uh, I'll give some personal experience and hopefully that that can uh, provide some insights as to how you should approach things. Um, yes. I, I, I went into business 
uh, for a simple reason. Not because I love business. It's quite fun, uh, but it's not because I love it. If I love it, I wouldn't leave it for politics. You know, when I when I wanted to sell my companies, a lot of my friends didn't believe me. You started this company yourself. You are so willing to let go after ten years. Uh. Wow, nothing wrong. Wow. <laughs> you know that 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 sort of uh, sentiment. Uh, I I had no problems letting go. Uh, the reason is because uh, the, the the reason is because the reason I entered business was to get out of the wage slavery that would tie me down for the rest of my life. Now, when I when I started work, I worked in the Accenture, previously known as Anderson Consulting, yes. basically an uh, IT consulting firm. And as I I did quite well in the organization, I was about to be promoted after one and a half to two years, um, but I quit. I quit because a few reasons. Number one, um, I saw my partners, my, my managers, or my consultants getting promoted to manager, my managers promoted to assistant uh, or, or associate partners. They got higher pay and they are paid quite well, but their workload ballooned. You know? The partners are traveling around the region hardly at home, not seeing their kids, don't have family time. You know, they fit really well. They drive very nice cars. <laughs> you know, they don't have a life. Um, and then I, 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 I feel like young and stupid. Uh, so I went to my partner and asked him, um, boss, uh, you know, if I perform really, really, really well, uh, let's say uh, I perform really, really, really well, top of the class, whatever, how soon can I be a partner? He said, well, you know, in, in really speedy cases, maybe about 10 years, 11 years, you know, that, that sort of time. I was about 20, that was 90, 90, 96. So I was about 24 then. Okay. Wow, 10 years, I'll be 34 by then, no? Before I become a partner. Um, so I asked him. Do you think I can be a partner by eight years uh, if I'm fantastic? <laughs> very, very, very confident. Yes. Very fresh. You know, yeah. uh, I shy thinking about what I did then. Uh, but can I? About eight years. Shit. Very unlikely. Wow. So that was my dream of retiring by 30. And that gave me the thinking that, you no, know, uh, thinking that. If I ever want to get out of the workspace and not be tied down to an occupation basically for the rest of your life until you are 55 or 60, okay, the only way is to start a business. So I started the business with the objective to be retired by 30, to achieve my financial freedom by 30. Retired doesn't mean not doing anything. Retired just means I can do anything else I want without having to be worried about my financial uh, needs, okay, yes. by 30. Uh, I failed to do it by 30. Uh, I managed to retire by 35, so that wasn't uh, too bad. Uh, yes. So, so yes. Th that, that, that is my approach to things. Not, not everyone have to take it so extreme like I did. Like, yes. Uh, I was a little bit extreme. Uh, but I think everyone needs to start thinking about their future. It can come from starting a business. It can come from an investment. Investment can be in the form of property. It can be in the form of stocks. Okay. What you shouldn't do, whether it is property or stocks or business, is to speculate. Okay. Speculation is a form of gambling. Okay? Uh, if you're investing in a business, whether your own or somebody else, you invest because you believe in the business, in the long term, okay. not because you think, hey, this stock, uh, I heard the news, uh, tomorrow this time contract, uh, it might go up 20%. I could really buy today, within three days contract, I sell and make some money. Okay, That is not going to build your future. Okay. Yes, it's gambling. Uh, what, you, yeah, what you invest in really depends on your comfort level. Uh, if you are financially experienced, so you are very good in numbers, and you love stocks, you understand companies, you can read accounts, then sure, you go into details of companies and select companies individually to invest. Okay? If you are not good, okay, 
then perhaps you need to look at mutual funds. Or nowadays, there are more interesting products like ETFs. Yes, it where is. you yeah ETFs and you you, you track uh, financial results. Or and and you should have a diverse portfolio, some in stocks, and some perhaps in some properties. Okay. Uh, I I believe that you should try and purchase your first property uh, as early as possible instead of renting. Unless, of course, you are staying in your papa mama's house, then you can wait. Uh, but if, like me, I came from Batu Pahat, I have to rent a place, I wanted to buy my first property as soon as I can. Yes. So, 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 so those are the considerations to make. So it's not a yes. one shoe size fit all type scenario. It really depends on the individual, the person, your financial yeah. stability. And you must recognize your own financial stability. Some people yes. cannot count for this, and they must realize that. And then mm. you take investment decisions based on that understanding of yourself. But some people are very good in numbers and very good, uh, makes very good uh, 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 investment decisions. They can then stock pick, uh, whether in Malaysia, in US, or the rest of Yes, I pick up a few points on what you said, actually. Um, you said that um, you wanted to retire at 30, 35. I think that's the dream of all young people today. So I am very sure that you're very young because uh, to retire at 30 is uh, everyone's dream. And the second thing you also mentioned... Dream, um, dream was, thing, uh, dream, yeah. Dreams must be actionable. Yes. So if you dream about it, you must find a way to action it. It's not just yes. a, a, a daydream. Yeah. Yes, I think that's a generational thing as well. I think a lot of young people are trying to uh, venture into business. It could be the real business, but it also could be investments in portfolios. It could be also young people are very uh, involved recently in cryptocurrencies as well. So the fact is that I think it's a crowded space in business as more and more young people come into the economy. And then, for example, the headline GDP growth is now 4% and no longer 9% in the 1990s. So the turnover rate, I feel, is... Uh, the business lifespan of each business is pretty short. And um, I think it's a combination as well, despite the fact that, you know, some jobs will turn over, some companies will last for a shorter time. And the fact we take mortgages for 35 years these days. So that kind of security, I mean, does it still make sense? Or are we really going to be generation rent? <laughs> um, I, 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 I think it does. I think many people underrate, especially young people, they underrate the potentials of compounding uh, returns from your investments. Uh, it's similar to property, but I'll take a stock, for example. If you had invested $1,000 okay, in Amazon back in 1999, and right through it, through the ups and down, ups and down, ups and down, if I'm not wrong, you'll be close to a millionaire today. Just $1,000. Okay, That's an extreme scenario. And when you buy stocks, you buy a portfolio of it. So not every stock is going to perform as well. Uh, yes. But it's important to invest and it's important to be patient. We always look at it from a short term. Yes. You know, And if you are buying stocks, a lot of people look at it short term. Oh, go up 20% really, take profit. You know? And then if you do that for Amazon, you will miss out on the 1,000% returns that followed after that, you know, because it keeps going up. Yeah, when do I go in again? Why, have, why haven't it come down so that I can buy some more? You know? When it come down, then you say, hey, maybe wait for it to come down some more. Then only I buy some more, you know. Uh, then it doesn't come down. So, so those are speculative trading. Uh, so, so, so if you invest and you, you believe in your investments uh, uh, and don't buy stupid stocks, uh, then, then, then the possibility of compounding uh, your investments over time, 10 years, 20 years, can be immense. You know, put aside an amount every month uh, for investment purposes. Traditional investments, even property. So some things will grow faster than others, but my view is that doesn't matter so much as long as it grows. Okay. I think that's a very comprehensive answer for different aspects of personal finance. So we have an expert in national finance talking about personal finance for young people. That is something that everyone watching is so appreciative of. So uh, without further ado, we will move on to the federal budget. I'm just going to share the screen as well. Um, 
In budget 2021, uh, November 2020, the finance minister unveiled an expansionary budget of 322.5 billion ringgit. That is an increase from 314 billion ringgit in 2020. The economy was predicted to grow 6.5 to 7.5 percent. However, with the rise of a delta strain and subsequent lockdowns, the latest forecast is 4 to 4.5 percent. Then some of the other key attributes as well. Um, sovereign rating agencies like Fitch has rated us BBB plus uh, downgraded last December. Um, SMP, Senate and Poor, rated as A minus negative outlook. So the second characteristic I'd like to point out is also the development expenditure, operations expenditure, and COVID fund. So I think you can see it as well in the graph. Huh? So it says that 21.4% of the budget last year was in development. 73.3% was about operations. That's paying um, some of the emoluments. Uh, that's your salaries so or civil servants. That are some of your ministry expenditure and government. And then 5.3% remaining was reserved for the COVID fund. In terms of the national debt, I think this is um, the key issue that um, YB Tony Po have been talking about and also in the public is that the Malaysian national debt is somewhere between 58 60, 62, even total gross debt can be as high as 90% depending on the definition. So the rising debt that has increased recently. Um, the fourth thing is budget deficits. We have been in budget deficit since 1998, nonstop. So this year, the budget deficit is increasing to 7%. Um, two last uh, one last point is the current account surplus, which has gone down to 4.2%. And um, the current account surplus is the net exports of services and goods and uh, income and investment derived as well as cash transfers. So the total in, um, exports of a country in these areas. So sovereign rating agencies, development versus operations, rising public debt, maybe 62% and fiscal deficit, uh, shrinking current account surplus. Do you have any comments of our national budget? <laughs> um you again have cited a mouthful of uh, data and statistics. Yes. Um, I, I won't go into those details. Uh, I won't bore your audience with the elaboration of those numbers. Uh, but I'll put it this way. Uh, under normal circumstances, under normal circumstances, normal performing economies, uh, we should have a minimal budget deficit. Minimal meaning plus minus 2%. Because we're growing more than 2%, it is okay to have a deficit generally. Um, but under crisis scenarios, as we stand today, uh, all your budgetary limits should be almost, almost all, uh, should be thrown out the window because you need to get out of the crisis first before you can normalize your uh, nation's growth, economic growth. Uh, and it is what's happening today. In fact, what I'll say is perhaps it is not enough of what's happening today. So we should spend more in certain areas, whether to help businesses or to help people who are suffering from the crisis. Yes. Um, but overall, taking the crisis aside, uh, what has happened over the past decade is that um, is that uh, the, the the what do you call it? The bureaucracy has taken over the budget. So what has happened is that our budgets have increased, our expenditure has increased, our deficit your know, deficit every single year and high. Uh, relatively high at times, even during good years, uh, that has created a situation that uh, exacerbated the problem for us today. So now that we want to spend more, uh, we are tr having trouble finding enough money for us to spend more, uh, even though we can, uh, but it just becomes more expensive for the government. Uh, and perhaps in those years uh, before 2018, uh, a lot of the funds were not spent in productive sectors. A lot of funds were expanded into 
sectors that didn't bring the necessary economic multipliers. It could be because of overpriced projects. It could be because of an oversized civil service. It could be because of um, 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 just doing expenditure that didn't bring returns on the economy. And what the previous governments did also, which was uh, relatively ingenious, is to spend even more outside of the budget. So you see MRT, a best example, uh, MRT. Yes. This project, MRT1, costs approximately 30, 32 billion ringgit. Not a single cent of that 32 billion ringgit was budgeted in the government's budget. Everything was outside the budget. But a loan was taken to build the MRT. Now, who pays the loan when the loan is due? The government. So what has happened is because of all these expenditure that is outside of the budget that the government previously took, they have committed the government to pay this debt in the future. Hmm. So today, my hands are even more tight okay, because of this extra budgetary expenditure yeah. that was taken by the government in the past. So these are some of the issues and challenges we face in public finance. Uh, and hence, hence, one of the key principles that we have always advocated uh, and we put in place, uh, causing a fair bit of unhappiness uh, uh, when we came into power, number one was to ensure that all projects must be tendered, barring exceptions. And the exceptions are far and few in between, specialized cases, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, army secrecy, or that sort of stuff, we can accept. But nothing yes. else should be directly negotiated. Okay. Number two, we went through a lot of mega projects and realized that they were so fat, there was quite a few billions to be saved. And we actually cut a lot of fat. You know, MRT2, for example, was ongoing. We managed to reduce the contract price by 8.8 .8 billion ringgit. LRT3 was just about to start. We managed to reduce the overall budget by approximately, if I don't remember wrongly, about 15 billion ringgit. So it's huge reductions uh, in cost. And these savings can then be channeled into future expenditure for the people uh, in subsequent governments. Of course, we never got that subsequent years uh, in place uh, because we were kicked out. Uh, but, but overall, the context of looking at the government's budget uh, is... Is always needs to be number one, uh, dealing with the situation in a crisis. All these numbers throw it out of the window. Okay. okay. Uh, but in normal circumstances, what we need to do is we need to have a budget that creates effectiveness in spending, and we don't have that at the moment okay. uh, in the government's budget. Okay. Yes, I think I picked up a few points here. Um, okay. So. You think that it's better to spend in the crisis and then to save when the make hay during sunshine. Um, the I remember I quoting your book I think you mentioned um, under Permandu Idris Jala ten years ago to justify subsidy rationalization. It said that uh, Malaysia's debt is going um, we're going to be bankrupt by twenty nineteen. I think that was also the DAP narrative as well. The country is going bankrupt. It was in the government, uh, 900 billion, 1 trillion, 1.4 trillion. That was the numbers that were thrown around and then everyone was a bit shocked. And then that fed to the hate, hatred against the government under Barisan National. You know, the rising national debt going to be bankrupt and then the change of government. So now currently, after being bankrupt since 2018 or 2019, apparently we have now money to have a 540 billion aid stimulus packages. Of course, maybe 15% fiscal injection. But it's just when... Um, what do you think? Are we is our budget healthy? Because I I've seen like some of the budgets around the world. Um, our neighbors are maybe like um forty one percent net debt to GDP in Thailand, forty four percent in Philippines, thirty percent Indonesia, and maybe it's higher in Singapore, one hundred thirty percent, and then maybe it's like uh ninety percent UK, two hundred twenty percent in Japan and Greece. How what level is good for Malaysia? Can we service our debt repayments in the future in light of slowing economic growth and revenue? Is our budget still healthy, our balance sheet? Okay. Number one, um, I don't think I've ever said that Malaysia will become bankrupt. Okay. A lot of politicians did say. Yes. But the meaning of a country becoming bankrupt is quite different from a company becoming bankrupt. 
So assuming you hear politicians say, ah, country is going bankrupt, ah, it doesn't mean that country is going to stop to ex stop existence. A com company, a company, when it goes bankrupt, it means close shop, right? A country doesn't close shop because a country is always there. So when someone, uh, what do you call it, casually says the country is going bankrupt, he basically means, or it is intended to mean, that we are run, we we are running under severe cash strains. It's going to be very difficult for the country to borrow more money or costly to borrow more money yes. to finance our debts. Yeah. That's simply it. So we yeah. will have difficult time because the government yes. will have not have enough money to fund your subsidies. They will have money. They will always have taxes, but just not enough, and they will struggle to meet all the. Uh, what do you call it, the, 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 the obligatory spending that they need to do on an annual basis. Uh, so, 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 so even though uh, we said that the country was facing immense amount of debt, that doesn't mean that the country cannot take on more debt. It is just more expensive. But in the event of a crisis, you have no choice but to take on more debt because otherwise you won't get out of crisis. You know, if you try to be, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, 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 what's the word for it, Rick? Um, you try to be, uh, you know, there's, a, there's a word for it. You try to be uh, austere. austere. Austerity. Okay. You try to be austere during a crisis, your country will die before you become bankrupt. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. So, so, so we just have to borrow. The cost of funding is higher and the obligations to pay will be higher in the future. But we worry about the future after we get out of the crisis. So that's basically the, 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 the simple uh, explainer on bankruptcy and debt that we are currently facing. So whatever debt that we are taking today, uh, there will be an obligation to repay in the future. Uh, it would mean potential tightening of valves in the future to repay these debts. But it's something that we think about later because we have to get out of this crisis. Yeah. So I think to summarize, uh, you think that we have a lot of fisc we have fiscal space to continue to support the economy currently. Yep. It's getting tighter. It's getting more expensive. But yes, Malaysia is not in the worst position. We are not Zimbabwe, thankfully. Uh, we are not Singapore. Uh, we can borrow as much as it wants. Uh, so, so we could have done better, but thankfully we are not in the worst positions uh, out there. Okay, so the debt service repayment making up maybe fifteen percent of the annual it's budget and rising is very high. Is there a structural problem? Is is it, it is mitigatable? A structural problem. And a structural problem contributed by many of the off-budget projects uh, that was committed to by the government of the past. Okay. So the next question uh, is about a stimulus packages. So I'm just going to hop down to where the stimulus packages are. Yes. Um, so in March 2020, there was a prihatin package worth 250 billion ringgit. In April 2020, there was a prihatin plus package worth 10 billion ringgit. In June 2020, there was a panjana package worth 35 billion ringgit. In September 2020, there was a kita prihatin worth 10 billion ringgit. In January 2021, there's permai for 15 billion ringgit. In March 2021, there was permakasa for 20 billion ringgit. In May 2021, there was permakasa plus. Finally, in June two months ago, permule 150. 50 billion ringgit. So this works out to more than 530 billion ringgit. 34% uh, of our GDP uh, were eight packages and more. Maybe about 15% fiscal injection, maybe 70, 75 billion or so, but spread over two years. Do you think the stimulus packages that were implemented by the government was targeted, was timely, was effective, was it adequate? Um. I'll start by number one saying that never believe all the figures that are put out there. Okay. Because uh, if you read carefully, many of the figures are designed to inflate because you need to announce big numbers. So the government needs to announce big numbers for two reasons. Number one, uh, political position. You need to show the people you're spending money to help, even if you don't have money. Okay. 
Number two, to build confidence that you can do it. So there are a lot of, uh, what do you call it, uh, numbers that never get achieved okay, uh, in these numbers. So uh, I'll give a very simple example. I'll announce a uh, 5 billion loan for SMEs in the tourism sector. Okay, 5 billion, okay, guaranteed by government. But the number of tourism sector companies that are going to apply for loans today is going to be very little. Okay, so your 5 billion figure will never be fully drawn down. Maybe 500 million will be drawn down. That's an example. It's also a lot got to do with government guarantees. So it's not a direct, as you mentioned just now, direct fiscal injection. It's just a guarantee for SMEs or companies to borrow money, uh, which is important, okay? But it contributes to your big number that, uh, wow, how do you even count this number? You know, how many zeros are there behind the scenes? It, 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 that is, it's meant to shock and awe uh, the, the readers and audience. Number two, without going to specific details of the plan. Now, let's give the plan and the targets and the objectives the benefit of the doubt. Okay, so let's not go one by one and critique every single one. Okay, there are, you can, but let's not do that now, not on this show anyway. Okay, let's give it the benefit of the doubt. The biggest problem to these plans are the execution. How are they executed? How much leakages are there? How difficult or easy it is for companies and people to gain access to these funds? Okay. So you can say that, oh, yeah, I'm helping companies, uh, all companies to, what do you call it, uh, uh, pay 20% of their wages as long as they don't sack any stuff for next three to six months. So, something like that. You will find that there are a lot of complaints among companies who can't get access. You also hear of companies who broke their companies into five different companies and applied for the, the grant and got it five times. You know, let, let such things happen. So efficiency and efficacy of the distribution of the funds are very important. Okay, they, 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 in fact, are the most important elements of any plan, whether they succeed or don't succeed. You can announce as big a figure as you want, as pretty a program as you want, but when it comes to implementation, when you fail to implement properly, the people who are you're supposed to assist don't get assisted. The people who knows their way around get more than what they deserve, and that will create problems uh, in the economy going forward. So to me, the execution bit is extremely, extremely important. And it is in this specific area that I find the government is left the most wanting. You can criticize each program, but by and large, it's somewhere there. You know, okay. by and large, the there. teachers and growers, somewhere there. Maybe you should put a bit more here, can change a bit more here, change the terms here. But by and large, it's somewhere there. The main yes. issue yes. is execution. If they can execute this 90%, then actually the difference between my view and the government's view on the details of the program, not very relevant okay. because it's executed. But exactly. if it is so the execution makes up for the bulk of the failures of the government. Okay. Do you have any specific initiatives you think the government should have implemented that they did not under a stimulus package? Do you have any instances of this implementation um, problems that has come up? Like you mentioned a few just now already, like breaking up a company to five to get five grants. Um, are there any other implementation examples? or? Um, I... I that, that... I, there, there are other examples which I won't uh, cite now, uh, but I would also I will go to your first question, which is perhaps some of the other um, what do you call it uh, programs that the program uh, the government can launch. So we yes. have submitted a memo to the Ministry of Finance uh, just last week, yes. and indeed we actually put in quite a few uh, new proposals uh, to assist businesses. Uh, one example is this. Now, a lot of people blame workspaces for clusters in COVID. It's okay. not only workspaces, but it is one contributor to clusters, one important contributor. It's not the only contributor. So shutting down factories alone will not solve your COVID problem, but it is okay. a contributor. 
Uh, and what we need to do is make sure that these factories, these workspaces upgrade their facilities to ensure that they have better ventilation, better space for social distancing, better, less chances of spreading COVID in the workspace. Okay, so they need to upgrade, whether it is the factory production line or whether it is the foreign workers hostel, they need to upgrade. Yeah. The problem with a lot of these companies, we are already suffering under COVID. Okay, you can give me all your new laws and guidelines with regards to uh, social distancing, hostels and stuff. If I'm suffering already, okay, mm. I don't have money to invest. Yes. yes. Right? So I truly, truly uh, pretend to invest, but then I invest uh, or do a bit, a bit, a bit half big solution. Doesn't solve your COVID problem. Okay. Create potential new clusters in the future. Everyone also needs to shut down. Okay. Mm. So what the government needs to do is not only to provide loans for cash flow or keep their workers they actually need to provide grants to actually help them pandemic proof their factories and workspaces mm -hmm. so it is not only for the individual factories it is actually for the entire nation because as long once the the, the, the factories are pandemic proven okay then what will happen will be the likelihood of outbreaks becomes lower and the need for us to think about shutdown and lockdowns in the future is reduced dramatically. Okay, and then young people can go back to work again. Yes, I think a lot of young people are looking forward to getting back to work again. Because yeah. some of the complaints are that has come for this um, stimulus packages are not from individuals, are my friends, but also the chambers of commerce, the Malaysian German Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the Japanese Chamber of Trade and Industry, the Malaysian Dutch Business Council, all have complained about half big SOPs, whereby uh, dormitories are in the different industry or with their factories, or the fact that a the whole supply chain is not accounted for, whereby the main business is essential, but the supply chain packaging, transport, logistics that surround the business is not essential. So in the end, the whole business uh, and supply chain is disrupted. And um, one one of my friends, um, I have a friend who works in Bank Nagara as an uh, analyst. He said that the loan moratorium program, I think it takes up the biggest part or very big part of the stimulus packages. Apparently only 10% take up rate amongst households and um businesses. So I think a lot of people were wary of the fact they don't pay for two years, it will increase their interest and their sum in the, their paid sum in the end. So the loan moratorium was not as effective as we I imagine or some of my friends imagine. Um, maybe the wages, the wage subsidy. So the first time, the first wage under Prihatin, the subsidy was um, up to 200 workers only. It was 600 ringgit, 800 ringgit, and 1,200 ringgit, depending if you're a large, medium, or micro company. So later, it was only in the fourth wage subsidy program that they do away with the limits of workers and removing the cap of 4,000 ringgit when giving out this subsidy because a lot of people make more than 4,000 ringgit. So yeah, I think this is just some of the issues that my friends have brought up. Lah. You know, maybe raw material stuck in a factory because they are doing packaging and not manufacturing, they can't do it and it might perish. Or some of their furniture stuck at the port, you know, or even, yeah, just supply chain disruptions. And maybe like a food business is essential, but a food machinery that supports it is not essential. And then the, the police will come and um, they might threaten to find you if the SOP is not very clear and if you're not be strictly following it. So some of the problems are just wage subsidies, the loan moratorium, um, the chambers of commerce have voiced out. Yeah, do you have any final comments about some of the implementation? Um, I, I won't comment in detail on the implementation, but I want to take it one step forward. Uh, yeah. That is, uh, we are at a stage where lockdowns don't work anymore. Okay. Um, I think there are still people out there clamoring for tighter lockdowns. Um, it doesn't work. Uh, okay. Or it has highly diminished returns. Reason being, you can shut down these factories, assuming the work, some of the workers are infected. So they don't come to factory to work. They stay in their dormitory. Right? So they don't spread in the factory, they spread in the dormitory. Yeah, it's the so it's still... Yes. It's the same. Okay? So... Lockdowns have come to a point where it produces very little additional return, however more tight you want to tighten the screw. But what mm. it has in turn done 
it's created a lot of economic hardship throughout for everyone. Yes. So, um, two things have to happen. Number one uh, is that after a majority of the population have been vaccinated, we have to learn to live with COVID. We are never ever going to get a situation where number of COVID numbers is perhaps in a few hundred. It's not going to happen. But what we want to make sure or try to make sure is that the number of deaths that we experience on a daily basis because of COVID is negligible. Yes. So you can have, say, uh, 5,000, 8,000 cases a day. But that's okay because there are zero deaths or zero, uh, or only three ICU. Say, uh, only three ICU. And none among those people who have been vaccinated. That's the target we have to meet. We cannot in, be in perpetual lockdowns. Okay? Uh, we are destroying business value, uh, long-term investors to move elsewhere, and it will take an even, it will be an even steeper slope for us to climb out of the crisis in the years uh, to come. Okay? That's number one. Number two, we must do away with this concept of essential and non-essential. Okay? It no longer makes sense if it even did in the past. Reason is very simple. Your friends, some of them open cafes and they are very progressive. They make sure that all the ventilation is in place. They make sure that there's a distance between the tables and they make sure that if there's a table limit, they follow the table limit, two per table or three per table or four per table, they follow the table limit. So infections in these cafes are actually very low, negligible, okay? They get shut down. At the first instance, they get locked down. But factories where the risks are higher due to crowding, okay, just because they are so-called essential or part of the essential supply chain, they automatically get to remain open for yes. economic reasons. Now, I'm not saying shut down the essentials. I'm saying the approach should be risk rating for businesses. So those with higher risk rating when the cases load go up, certain measures come into place. Like factory workers go to factory every week, twice must do testing. Okay, those measures need to be put in place for these essential high risk operations to take place, so that you can quickly sieve out those positive cases and alien uh, and isolate them from the rest of the factory. So that mindset of shutting down non-essential and essential must change. You cannot shut down all the low risk industries and causing huge economic hardship to all these people. So many friends of mine have decided to close their restaurants because tak boleh tahan lagi. How to tahan? Right? Okay. But they were low risk. So we are killing economic value here. Imagine to restart the whole business again, how much value is lost in the process. Uh, uh, and keeping your high risk, higher risk and the same party that's contributing a significant portion of your cases alive and return. So it, it doesn't make sense anymore. We need to change our paradigm from a essential, non-essential paradigm to one that is risk-based paradigm. So if it is low risk, under whatever circumstances, you don't have to shut down. Okay. If it is high risk, then depending on circumstances, there are steps that need to be taken to ensure that the risk is mitigated. Okay, those are some of the measures that we have proposed to MOF to take, uh, and hopefully the government will adopt them uh, going forward. So, um, you might advocate, despite having 15,000 over cases, the highest so far since we recorded COVID, that this might be the time to unlock the uh, economy. How would that work? Will it be a ban on inter district travel still, but businesses are allowed to open, or I is it? Um, Inter-district travel is not banned, everyone can open, but when there's a case, you just lock down one business at a time. How specific is the lockdown group going to be? Okay, without, without going into details, it oh. needs to be correlated. The opening, the gradual opening is needs to take place, but it needs to be correlated with one, risk, and number two, vaccination. So say, for example, uh, one particular... Just for example, uh, one particular city is 90% vaccinated. Why do you still want to shut down that city? Yes. yes. Right? 
So there's no need to shut down the city anymore, especially for the low risk uh, businesses. So it's progressive, it will be gradual. So the issue isn't so much the 15,000 cases. The issue is how uh, people who get infected, might they end up in the ICU or might they die? If that becomes very little, then it should be opened fully. So vaccination is a key component of that particular exercise. Yes. Um, what you mentioned as well, I think in Labuan, in Kuala Lumpur, where vaccination rates are very high, the, there's strong economic reason to open these places. And um, where cases are zero in police, there's, uh, there's a strong case to open. So maybe a more targeted uh, gradual reopening is in order. Um, but but yes, I mean, there's but always... Yes, but there might be a... Um, how do you call this? There might be a degradation of the COVID Delta variant. Uh, I think the UK is uh, unlocking their economy on the 19th July, a few days ago. So we, we yet, it remains to be seen and yet to be seen whether the hospitalizations will overwhelm the NHS. Um, so I mean, the, the science is evolving. So I mean, we hope to live with the virus nonetheless, yeah. Uh, I think the adopting that position and implementing the UK position is two different things. No, adopting a living with COVID position does not mean tomorrow everything is free. You don't need to wear masks anymore. Yeah, you can go night. So I think that's a bit extreme. So UK has taken a, a little bit of an extreme situation to announce a freedom day. No, mm -hmm. I believe that we should open, but we should continue to be vigilant and careful. There's no such thing as taking off your mask. Mask is going to be staying here for a long, long, long time. You know, <laughs> why do you need to take off mask? Whereas in UK, they announce you can go around without mask anymore. You know, so yep. so those yep. are the those are the the things we can agree that we want to live with COVID and take things at a gradual basis. Don't no lockdowns anymore, but we gradually open up the rest of the economy. Uh, okay. But we don't have to take the extreme scenario that UK did, which carries a lot of risk. And a lot of uh, a bit is a bit of a gamble. Okay. Yes, I appreciate your views on this point. I would like to bring your attention to helicopter money, which is also related to Bantuan uh, Brim under Prime Minister Najib. That has become Bantuan Sarah Hidup and then Bantuan Rakyat Prihatin. Um, and also it comes with stimulus checks. So maybe under the latest Pomule packages, um, B40 households might get 500 ringgit. M40 households might get 350 ringgit, and that might be split into two payment terms, maybe September and November. Uh, do you think helicopter money should increase cash transfers, especially during COVID? What do you think about Malaysia becoming a welfare state? Um, what do you think about universal basic income? Uh, number one, bantuan should continue for the people who deserve the bantuan. Full stop. Okay. Uh, what we had a problem with was that the bantuan was used as a political tool to buy votes. Okay. among people who don't necessarily need the money. So that's the that's the challenge. Where do you draw the line? Yes. Uh, yes. Cash handouts are important, especially during a crisis, to people who are affected, people who have lost their job, people who have lost income, uh, people who have suffered uh, bereavement, uh, people who have been uh, uh, basically financially affected as a result of COVID needs cash assistance, okay, direct or indirect. So there's no question about it. It is to make sure that the right people receive the aid. Uh, as for universal basic income, I think that needs, uh, the, that's the whole, that's to some extent, the point of um, uh, some of this aid to top up, uh, to make sure that you receive a basic uh, minimum income. We have also announced minimum wages for people who have worked, uh, and hopefully that over time will allow people to enjoy higher standards of living. Okay. Because on this graph uh, by the World Bank Aim High 2021, it says Malaysia on the right graph, one of the lowest. Uh, only, uh, I mean, the coverage is quite high, but up to 7% of their household income, the benefit amount is only 7% of their household income. It's a very low amount. Is there space, fiscal space in Malaysian budget to increase cash handouts so that it becomes monthly instead of like every three months or maybe it becomes closer to the minimum wage of 1,200 rather than a few hundred? Um, I, I don't believe, I think the, the, the data is skewed because it doesn't take into a, a lot of context. Uh, the Malaysian government actually have a lot of hidden subsidies 
put in place everywhere, uh, including, for example, your fuel subsidies. Uh, that doesn't in get incorporated into the fact that you are actually paying uh, reduced prices for, for, for fuel, for example, uh, and that should actually be incorporated into your overall uh, subsidy calculation. So that the data isn't entirely reflective of the situation, uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, to, 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 to uh, speak on the other side, uh, uh, budget should also be dependent on how much tax you can raise. You know? uh, Malaysian taxes has been fairly generous. Income tax is not super high. It's not the lowest. It's not super high. It's higher in Indonesia. It's higher in Thailand. But of course, it's lower in Singapore and uh, some of tax havens like uh, Ireland. Uh, yes. But at the same time, we don't have a lot of other taxes. Of course, yes. we have removed the GST. Uh, that's mm -hmm. one. Uh, but we also don't have wealth or capital gains tax. So the, the rich enjoy gains on their wealth without being taxed. So that's that's some issue for the young people to think about, to look at, uh, as to whether, you know, uh, if you want to tax more on asset gains yes. derived from assets, uh, so that more can be spent on uh, helping the basic income or grants for the poor. Okay, so it's a policy choice for young people. But do you think within the existing tax framework, there is space to increase some of these uh, benefits to B40 households? Huh? I think there's always room, but something needs to be sacrificed. It's a trade-off. Okay. So what do you want to trade-off? You know, that's always a policy decision. Yes. Okay, so um, coming back, to the next question. So this is about Pakatan Harapan's 22 months in power. What are some of your um, biggest financial economic reforms that were undertaken and what you wish to do if you were back in power today? Um, I think we did a fair bit within the 22 months. Um, number one, uh, we reviewed the mega contracts and we have saved easily more than 40 billion ringgit, 40 billion ringgit. And don't forget the ECRL, uh, which was awarded by Najib uh, to the Chinese companies. Uh, we managed to reduce it by 22 billion. Uh, we have got other projects. That's number one. Number two, we put in place a, what do you call it, open tender policy. And that has created a tighter uh, financial administration. Unfortunately, the new government then let go again and did a lot more direct negotiation contracts. Uh, yes. Number three, uh, we also found uh, a lot of uh, uh, public-private sector collaboration in the interest of the Rakyat. So we managed to set up a insurance fund, My Salam, to help people who suffer from critical illness. It's a two billion minute fund uh, of which the government contributed zero. So it's entirely private sector driven, we got the two billion, and then we use it to dispense aid to people who suffer from critical illness. You know, you get eight thousand ringgit straight away. You get critical illness, or you get hospitalized, you get fifty ringgit uh, subsistence uh, replacement income uh, per day for up to fourteen days. Uh, we have also done uh, highway restructuring. We wanted to do more, but we picked uh, up before we could do more. So you are enjoying eighteen percent discount on. Uh, North Star Highway, not that you can travel a lot these days, like, but it's 18% discount on North Star Highway and it is perpetual. Remember in the past, it is to increase every three years 5%. Yes. This 18% yes. yes. reduction today fixed at this price for the rest of the concession. No, so no need to do re renegotiation of the concession, was that the main concession? Thing? Yes, that was the that was the objective, and we were in the process of renegotiating or restructuring uh, the Gamuda Highways, the LBT, the, the in your constituency, uh, Smart Tunnel, and I think there were there were four four or five highways involved among the Gamuda Highways that contributed to approximately fifty percent of the urban toll revenue. So if that has succeeded, we would have reduced our toll prices for the Gamuda Highway as well, while saving the government money. So the people save, the government save, so we can do more 
for the people. So those were some of the restructuring exercises that we were doing uh, that we, 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 we hope we can complete when we do come back to power uh, when the time comes. Uh, and the, the, uh, one of the uh, successes that we did was the digital angpao. Digital angpao. Digital angpao to get cashless transactions going. So now touch and go, grab pay, uh, uh, what's the other one? Um, suddenly forgot. Touch and go. Uh, boost. Yeah. Uh, boost. Okay. Are all very popular and everyone knows how to use it, including yes. old uncle and this. Because yes. we channel, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, grants, the digital angpao, through this electronic channel so that everyone will use digital payments and it came in a timely fashion so that we have a contactless economy. Uh, so it was yes. important, it created more acceptance and adoption of digital, digital transactions. Uh, and we make sure that the money is spent. Now, when we give grant, financial grant, okay, sometimes people save part of it, especially people who are not that poor, they receive the grant and I save the money. Lah, okay? But in this case, it's either you use it or it gets burned. So we make sure that whatever we spend, the people will use, it will benefit both the user as well as the merchant who benefit from the sale and transaction. So that we mm. actually put money into the economy and increase the multiplier effect uh, in the economy. So those were the, some of the little transformative ideas and concepts that we put in place. It's very public and private partnership. We don't try and do it ourselves. Previous government, if they were to do this, if they were to even think about it, they would have tried to set up their own wallet Wallet. and get their okay. own set up or wallet, build this mega 100, 200, mi uh, multiple 100 million servers to, to deal with the e-wallet and try to do what GrabPay and Boost and Touch and Go does. Waste of time, yes. duplication of resources. We yes. work yes. with the private parties that are really existing for the benefit of the nation. Okay. Yep. I got a few things. Uh, Pekka B40 insurance. Um, you have an North Highway, 18% discount. You are um, open tender for government contracts, as well as um, making digital payments normalized and expanding private-public partnerships instead of um, replicating, duplicating, crowding out private resources. Um, do you think... Because as a member of the public, I think some people... Um, were under the impression that Pakan Harapan came on an austerity drive. So the Banton Sarahido was a, a smaller amount than Brim. So a lot of people were angry. They were saying that rural people or Malay people were angry with the government. Do you think that holds water? And uh, how many percent of like government contracts were open tender? Because I, I think I read in your book sometime previously that my procurement, not all or very small amount of government contracts under individual ministries were open tendered. Yeah. More than half of the contracts were not tendered openly. Okay. Previously. Okay. And, okay. Uh, that changed to more than 90% were tendered openly under okay. our government. Okay. okay. Uh, that's one. Number two, austerity, that is not true. But they, there was, there was uh, what's the word for it? Rationalization. Uh, what type of rationalization? You no. Know, one of the things that were given out during Najib era was even people who are 24 years old, 25 years old, they get brim. Should that be the case? Eh? Brim. Be because I think from your perspective, you previously mentioned you should pay taxes and then you get government benefits. So young people... No, no, no. no. That's not, the, the, the point is not about taxes. The point is about taxes. should a 24, 25 years old who have just started work be getting brim? Brim. I'm in support because I benefit from it, but... Um... <laughs> should benefit is one thing, wanting is one thing, but should yeah. should a fresh graduate be getting brief? Mm. Right? What's your... What's for income, your... No, for income. Ah. For income. So, so, uh, so those are the, the, the questions that you'll deal with. That's number one. Number yeah. two, there was a lot of leakages. Okay. So some of these handouts, not brief, some of these other handouts were political. Okay. okay, there's this constituency, you know, uh, we give uh, some pretext to give some gada, the, the, the rubber tappers uh, subsidy. Never given before, but because of maybe elections or whatever, they gave that year. Yeah. 
should we continue? Mm. No. We don't continue, we get scolded. Mm. We continue, we are just continuing that previous legacy of giving that money for political purposes. Number three, there were subsidies for fishermen. Okay, so it's one of the biggest complaints. But we also know the subsidies for fishermen is where one of the biggest waste of subsidies they are. Because you know why? The subsidies for diesel, the fishermen by basically trading diesel in international waters, not catching fish. So they have subsidized diesel, they bring to international waters, they sell to the Indonesian fishermen, they earn their income from the subsidized uh, diesel. They don't earn income from catching fish. They sell the subsidized so, diesel. So we wanted to change that to based on load, the catch load. Yeah. Okay. Of course, that faced a lot of objections. So reforming a entrenched institution is not easy. It takes political will. Uh, when all the fishermen started complaining, of course they complain like they cannot make easy money from subsidized diesel. You no, know, they actually have to catch fish this time. Okay, mm. they complain. What do you do? Perception is, oh, this government very bad. They take away subsidy from fishermen, right? That's the perception. But we know the problem on the ground is they are trading subsidized diesel in international waters. Yes. How do you deal with that problem? You lose, you lose the the, the perception argument. So it's, it's, it's tricky. It's a fine line being in government. We tried to do it. We suffered some of the consequences. Uh, so perhaps some would argue we tried to do it too fast. But at the same time, our supporters are saying we are not reforming fast enough. So it's that 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 trigger that 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 judgment and balance that we have to strike uh, as part of a reforming government. Yes, yes, I can imagine the policy decisions and balancing and weighting that you have to and implement in government as well. So moving on to the next um, topic, uh, it will be about COVID recovery shape. And Malaysia's GDP has fallen 5.6% in 2020, the most severe recession since AFC 1998. Is it, are we experiencing a V-shape, a U-shape, a K-shape economic recovery? Um, honestly, I don't know. Mm. I know we will recover. What type of recovery? Uh, I'm not sure. How much damage uh, the recent lockdowns have done to our economy, uh, it's hard to tell without actual data. You know, whether the loss of confidence, the switch to other suppliers in other countries is a temporary or permanent adjustment. That's hard to tell until we, we go through that phase to see whether the orders return to the country. Uh, how much of the restaurants that are shut down would they come back yes. and start again? That's a question. So those, those are, and how severe it is, there's no real studies on it. What we have is yeah. just anecdotal evidence. So those are, so those are, those are what do you call it? Those are uh, factors that we need to consider and watch carefully as we try and climb out of this crisis. Yes, definitely. I just want to, um, have a small message to the audience uh, who are still watching us with us. We have about three or four questions left for today's webinar. If any of you have any comments for YB, Tony Pa, which are relevant, and you can drop them in the comment section below. I've seen a few comments already. Um, I'm going to continue with this slide for a moment. Just for everyone's benefit, uh, the Malaysia's GDP on the supply side is uh, dominated by services, 57.7%. Manufacturing provides 23%. Agriculture provides 7.4, uh, oil and mining and quarrying 6.8, and 4.4% by construction. On the demand side of the Malaysian economy, it is 94% domestic demand and 6.5% exports. So that's the structure of the Malaysian economy. And the next slide here is uh, highlights. So it looks as if from Bank Negara's quarter one, result and review um, most indicators have returned to normal so that is wholesale and retail trade um, industrial production electricity generation 
manufacturing purchasing managers index and gross exports. Most of them have breached 100 into positive territory in Q1, signifying a stronger economy. Um, do you have any comments? Um, do, you think, do you think Malaysian economy you, you, is going to grow from here or it still depends on external factors that are still very fluid? Malaysia's economy will grow. Will grow. Will grow. Question is how well it will grow and how fast it can grow and return to what it was before. So those are the factors that are still big question marks that we have to watch and see. And those are the issues that the government have to address so that businesses can get back up to their feet uh, as quickly as possible. And where the government actually have to put in place measures to make sure that we don't have to go into lockdowns anymore. Otherwise, the negative impact on the economy will be severe. Okay. So, for example, Malaysia's economy experienced 9% economic growth from 1967 to 1997. Um, GNI has increased 14 times over. However, the past 10 years from 2010, our economy grew 4%, a lower economic plane. The World Bank Aiming High Report 2021 said that our GNI per capita is 11,200, just 1,335 short of the high income current threshold. Why is the GDP and GNI growth falling? How do we raise our GDP potential? Are we still on track to become a high income developing country? And we can also start talking about the new economic drivers and competitiveness of the Malaysian economy moving forward. I think my, my reply is the same. We have to watch, wait and see. You know, wait and the government needs to monitor to, to put in place measures so that we, we can recover quickly. Do you think that um, Malaysia is the 28th largest exporter in the world? Okay, a few, just a three more rankings huh? um, under the Bloomberg Innovation Index. So Malaysia is ranked 29 out of 60 countries. So we are top quartile out of three. We have the World Bank doing business report 2020. We are 12 out of 190. We are also in the World Competitiveness Yearbook of 2021, 25th out of 64. So we are the top third of the country. Um, how do we improve from here? How come we show very well in these rankings, but our economic growth is slowing as well? Well, in the current context, it's easy to explain. Uh, current context is we are facing a crisis. Yeah. So everything that is textbook is thrown out of the window. So like I said, you know, to get back to where we are, we need to get out of crisis first. Yes. I agree as well. Do you have any particular um, ideas on where Malaysia should move forward into new industries and economic drivers to stay competitive ahead of our neighbours? Um, it, is, it is very easy to answer that question by saying that we must go into high tech. Okay. We must go into uh, less capital intensive industries. We must go into uh, more technologically advanced uh, uh, economy. Mm. Uh, but I think we also need to understand that uh, not all high tech needs to come to us, will come to us, okay? because we are not perhaps that ready for them. So the country, number one, needs to do everything it can to be tech ready for tech investors to come into the country. That's very important. In the 80s and 90s, we did well. Today, perhaps, we are not doing as well. But secondly, uh, often in their emphasis for technology, we forget that there's the other segment of our economy that needs to provide employment for the less skilled labor. So we cannot say that every Malaysian out there in our labor market are skilled. Okay? In Sabah, Sarawak, there are still plenty of people who are less than skilled and they need jobs. And hence, matching types of industries suitable for these states are important. Otherwise, uh, states like Kelantan, states like Perli, states like uh, 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 Sabah and Sarawak will forever be left behind. The only states that will continue to advance and improve are states which can attract these uh, high-tech type industries, Penang, Selangor, and maybe Johor. So it is, it is important for balance in terms of uh, 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 attracting 
investments. It is uh, important for balance when we structure the national investment policy. It's always very exciting to talk about tech, but yes. not everyone can work in tech. Yes, but Malaysia exports, I think 40% come from electronics and electrical machinery. So it looks like we are a value added and a tech company, uh, tech, sorry, a tech export driven country. Um, do you think we're becoming more competitive despite of some of the government policies that have been inconsistent or the fact that implementation has not been at its best? Do you think we're still becoming more competitive as a country compared to our regional neighbours, which are competing very fast? So you have Indonesia, you have Thailand, and um, you have Vietnam. So Vietnam produces most of the smartphones by LG, you know, for example, Samsung. And then Indonesia has a nickel battery a lot of uh, minerals, so they, they are attracting the, the battery businesses as well. And then Thailand as well as booming ICT sector and also their traditional sectors is rice and fish oil and fish sources. Yeah, Are we, are we competing or are we falling behind? Um, I, we, we have fallen behind. I think there's no question about that. But we are competitive. Uh, okay. We still retain certain competitive advantages compared to many of our neighbours. But if we don't back up, we don't uh, do the necessary uh, rebalancing as well as fill up our labor force, then of course the damage done to our economy over the longer term would be worse. Some of our neighbors might overtake us in the future. Yes, yes, I think um, a lot of our news commentators as well, they always talk about other countries. We used to compare with Korea and other countries like Hong Kong and Taiwan, and now we are competing with. Indonesia, Thailand, and um, even Vietnam. So um, the next question is, how do we increase graduate salaries, median, and mean wages in Malaysia? That's a very difficult question. Yeah. Um, the easiest, the, the most natural way to do that is to lift the entire country's economy. That's number one. But that's a function of everything we talked about earlier. And number two, we also have to lift the quality of young Malaysians, their skills, their critical thinking, and their decision making. Uh, so those, those are both correlating factors uh, that has an impact on salaries of young Malaysians. If the two doesn't go up in tandem, then we'll be stuck struggling to increase the median wage for young Malaysians are going forward. Do you think that wages are necessarily linked to education levels in the country? Could it be a fact that Malaysia has been highly educated and the fact that maybe they, maybe in the West, the problem was unionizations because they don't have bargaining power to ask employers to raise wages anymore because they are deunionized. Um, is that the same case in Malaysia whereby capital is gaining the upper hand over employees at the workplace and simply more supply of labor than demand or the fact that one more additional spanner in the work is mechanization so that's like automation as well so that reduces bargaining power of workers because a lot of these job menial jobs can be replaced by effect like machines no not not really not because of the reasons the list of reasons you mentioned just now. It is pretty much a function of our number one, economic growth. Number two, median skill level of young Malaysians entering the Malaysian uh, the labor force uh, at this point in time. So your, your economy determines the type of businesses that will come in, uh, their expenditure level, their investment, and your skill level will also determine how much you are attract, how attractive you are to these uh, businesses. So it's a it's a it's a it's a two prong thing. Uh, if your investments that come in are of course very competitive, and uh, you have Amazon setting up big shop here, Google setting up big shop here, you can be assured that they will uh, put up openings with higher pay for your graduates. Uh, at the same time, if your graduates are better skilled, better trained, then there will be increased demand for your resources uh, as opposed to expatriates or other, other senior experienced workers. 
Okay. Um, previously as well, I think people mentioned foreign workers make up 15% of our total workforce. Do they do work, foreign workers dilute or impact wage growth in Malaysia? Yes, they do. Um, to some degree, uh, it impacts the type of industries uh, businesses invest in. So if you can get cheap foreign workers easily, then I will invest in that does not require me to hire locals. Okay, because of I, I'm using the cheap foreign labor as a competitive advantage to manufacture my products. Okay. Uh, but if I don't have access to cheap foreign labor, then perhaps I need to invest in something else that deals with local labor that will create that competitive advantage. So, so while it's not a given that other businesses will succeed, uh, the presence of cheap local labor skills and distorts the uh, market investment process such that uh, more businesses are concentrated in these uh, cheap labor industries. Yes, that's a very comprehensive answer. So maybe I can also uh, wrap up today's session because we have covered so many things today, including financial advice for young people, talk about the fiscal deficit in Malaysia, the stimulus packages, government policies, whether they are effective, um, exports, wages, salaries. So um, the final summary, as the world tries to exit from COVID-19 amid new economic megatrains like automation, digitalization, what would you recommend Malaysia needs to undertake as a reform immediately, key and urgent economic reforms that we need to undertake? Um, again, as a summary of perhaps some of the points that we measured earlier, uh, number one, uh, we need a balanced uh, investment policy, okay. a functional one. And number two, perhaps something that wasn't quite highlighted earlier, uh, we need to step up in terms of quality of our educational institutions. Okay. Uh, and the quality in this case, I define it as two way. Number one, uh, academic quality. It is important. Some people say academic is no use. You just need technical. Not true. You need academic quality. You also need technical quality. And perhaps they are also for different markets. Technical quality would be more for your manufacturing and perhaps your engineering sectors. Academic quality perhaps would be more for your managerial or other types of sectors. So there are different needs of both these sectors and both these sectors require to be uh, in, in, the academic, in, the, in the education field needs to be upgraded to make sure that we can meet demands of future businesses. Yes, um, it's nice that you mentioned academic and TVET as well, vocational training, because um, I've seen nowadays there are a lot of people who are hiring traineeships. Even I've seen an advertisement on um, Instagram. So for example, it could be Toyota or Mercedes-Benz. They're hiring SPM graduates to come and work with them immediately under a trainee program, and that's hands-on, that's vocational. That is not academic. And then I also see studies whereby maybe academic students there is an oversupply, maybe there are more graduates than job available for those particular jobs. So how do we um, cure supply and labor mismatch? <laughs> That's the, what the policy administrator is supposed to do. Like. That's yeah. when you need to actually elect a government with brains and not a government who just knows how to dish out handouts. Okay, so maybe we can take two comments uh, from the comments here. I see one from Patrick. Uh. So, um, Sean, support DAP and YB all the way. What are the roles DAP is currently playing to gain wider support and secure a majority vote in the next general elections? Um, we need to stay relevant. Uh, for now, our position is to help the country get out of the COVID crisis, uh, yeah. make constructive uh, recommendations to the government. Uh, and if they don't listen, make constructive criticisms of the government uh, and continue holding our position. I think uh, change will come. Change has come and I believe it can come a little. Yes. 
Thank you for the uplifting message, YB. So the I see quite a few comments. This is by Arthur. I see Priscilla. I see Siume. Ah, I see one one question by Tokyo Aoyong. So this is YB. What can Malaysia do to be more attractive to FDI? <laughs> that's a that's a question that probably requires an essay to reply. Uh, but yes. in general, again, not too different from what I've stated earlier. We need to have better workforce. Uh, we need to have more consistent uh, policies uh, with regards to our investments. Is this a case of Malaysia losing our competitive advantages? Because it comes out in the media, for example, that we lose a maybe a subsidiary of Panasonic solar vet, solar cells kind of factory, or we're losing um, a car manufacturer's kind of subsidiary that's moving to Indonesia. But some of them are. I mean, Miti came out with a response saying some are company rationalization that's not uh, linked to our competitiveness. There's someone trying to bring their company subsidiaries together into a hub in Indonesia. Um, yes, like, do you, do you have any comments on any of these high-profile cases that are leaving Malaysia or coming into our region and countries? To be fair, um, without details on each of these investments, I, I, I can't say much. Uh. Uh, mm -hmm. Except that uh, if I were a foreign investor today, looking at Malaysia, looking at the current government, I would not have a lot of confidence. <laughs> so, 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 given that the policies are perhaps inconsistent, uh, and perhaps there are uh, uh, there are advantages in Malaysia, but there are also advantages in certain other countries. The balance of it, I go somewhere else. So that's my only educated guess which is why it's very important to get our policies straight, uh, our focus correct, and then to strengthen our future. Yes. Thank you so much, YB, Tony, for sharing your amazing insights into personal finance and national finance. I think all of us have learned so much today. We have gone a bit over time as well, one hour and 15 minutes. Thank you for all those who are still listening with us. We appreciate everything. Um, appreciate your comments as well. Um, if... Um, if you have any other further comments, you can leave them in the comment section below. I will take them personally on your behalf. But other than that, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this evening on Saturday night. Please like, follow, and subscribe. YB, Tony Poa, and the Dominic on Weekend Show on social media. We hope you enjoyed this session very much. Stay healthy and stay safe. Have a great evening ahead. Mm.